Surely, New Year's resolutions is not something new or strange to anyone. Each and every one of us must have been through this, whether it is to quit smoking or have a more balanced diet or start saving money. How many of us can boast actual success as a result of such resolutions? Unfortunately, the data shows a grim reality. As few as less than 10% manage to keep them for more than several months. Now, why is that, you might wonder? According to Mr. Mark Griffiths, Professor of Behavioral Addiction, it is easy for people to fall into bad habits and on trying to give up such habits, it is easy to relapse. According to Mr. Griffiths, people do not stick to their resolutions mainly because they set too many of them or they are unrealistic and can thus not be achieved. It is easy to soon feel burdened and overwhelmed unless you take one step at a time and set realistic goals. Furthermore, such people may also be victims of false hope syndrome. Unrealistic expectations of self-change what is it that separates the chaff from the wheat, though? And how does one go about staying on the right track? Join us and you will find not only how such goals can be set to last, but also how to go about them so as to fulfill your goals and achieve your resolutions. What we need to understand before setting out on a transformational journey, such as building a new, more positive life for oneself, is that it is a matter of breaking patterns. Breaking a pattern, however, is no easy job, irrespective of whether or not the habits we are trying to break are negative or positive. Fortunately, as difficult or even unachievable some goals set as resolutions might seem, it is in our power to obtain them into reality. The good news is, change doesn't have to be difficult. If, upon setting out your goals, you pay attention and think of manageable goals that will not overpower your will and build a sound strategy, you may create the major transformation you need to achieve your targets and turn into your desired self. On the one hand, it is a matter of how much one perceives they deserve to get from life. People's perceptions get in the way of what they actually achieve in their lives. People tell themselves they deserve less and thus obtain less. Others deny themselves things that any other human being may expect as a norm because they believe that this denial is necessary in order to provide for loved ones to have what they want. The problem is that what this kind of thinking does is make life very dull and also tends to cause resentment. So how does one avoid such situations? On the one hand, we have the issue of perception, as aforementioned, this can be solved by means of visualization, helped by a big work toward building new habits that sustain such transformation. Developing your routine Don't throw yourself on the big prey. Start small. The secret is including small habits in your daily routine and then developing them into units of your envisaged change. How is it that small habits could be the key to your transformation? Habits make an important part in someone's life. We may not realize this, but many of the things we do on a daily basis – stopping for coffee before work, reading the newspaper, taking a shower, exercising, watching TV, having a snack – are habits so programmed in our neurological pathways that we don't even know they exist. We move through our day like a plane on autopilot, automatically responding to the happenings of daily life based on the habits we've learned over time. Thus, by replacing one behavior with another and with the power of neuroplasticity, we can rewrite these cerebral pathways by relying on the power of small habits to start with. They are just kickstarters, which can lead to the kind of patterns one would like their life to build off to a more consistent lifestyle to the battle linking of the person trying to foster and implement change. In his book, Akash Kariya provides a list of small habits one can start with and perform on a daily basis to stimulate personal transformation. Small as they may seem, they have the power to lead to larger scale and long-term improvement in your life. Start with whichever one best fits what you intend to achieve. Here it is. Read for 10 minutes. 
do two push-ups, drink a small glass of water with lunch, stretch for one minute, write 25 words in your journal, put on your running shoes, sit down at piano, do one yoga pose, floss one tooth, laugh out loud once. The wonderful thing about such small habits is that they are easy to implement and by crossing them off a to-do list at the end of the day will do wonders to your self-confidence which may stimulate you to do more each day. The beauty of small habits is that they remove the willpower issue from the equation. Their small nature allows you to accomplish them using only minimal willpower. This prevents your brain from obsessing over how challenging your new habit is and leaves you plenty of leftover willpower to build upon these habits and continue to introduce new ones. The second reason small habits work so well is that they allow you to achieve small wins. Rather than setting huge goals and failing, you can set multiple goals and experience success over and over. Researchers have found that when you achieve a small goal, you may actually experience a large sense of accomplishment that is disproportionate to the act itself. This is highly beneficial, as no matter how small the task, it is often highly satisfying to cross it off the list and savour your small win. Your brain associates that sense of satisfaction with the completion of your task and motivates you to complete even more. This leads us into the third reason why the small habits scheme works so well. It is as if it is generating a ripple effect. One thing leads to another and driven by success, you find yourself wanting more and doing more as a result. This can create a true identify shift since your motivation will snowball as your perception of yourself changes, thus having you want to create stronger, more comprehensive habits that turn you into your better, more determined, stronger self. Thus, small habits have a great potential in helping out humans to work outside their comfort zone. The secret, though, is to start small and explore what you can handle before you take any major decision that might as well bring you down and thus ruin your self-esteem before you actually get to do anything. According to Akash Karia, the small habit concept is as much about implementing new positive behaviours as it is about learning how well your own brain and body respond to change. This is in fact what often drives one to giving something up before they even being doing it. In addition to poor willpower, often coupled with a lack of strategy, they simply feel at stress with the changes they should be undergoing as a result of their resolution and soon they give up rather than trying to find a way to succeed. So, unless you feel like adding to your list of failures, it is best to just take baby steps and try things out a smaller scale. Going further now, beyond the level of small habits, we come to Keystone Habits, a concept explored by Charles Duhigg, author of the book The Power of Habit. Why we do what we do in life and business a small change in routine that can set off a chain reaction of new and improved behaviours. What is the difference between a small habit and keystone habits? When you perform a small habit, say, for example, putting on your running shoes every morning, you are successful as soon as you put your running shoes on, whether or not you actually go for a run. A keystone habit, on the other hand, is only a keystone habit if it eventually leads to other behavioural changes. While small habits certainly have the potential to breed other habits, they are not by definition required to do so. Once established, keystone habits can act as a significant catalyst for change in your personal and professional life. Such as, for example, you make the decision of doing two push-ups a day Encouraged by your success in doing so, at the end of the day, you cross this off the list and by the feeling it gives, the enjoyment of actually having achieved this goal on your list of minor things to start with in order to bring about a change in your life, you end up doing one more each day. And this can lead to healthier decisions for yourself, exercising each day, eating healthier. This is the very essence of a keystone habit. It has this ripple effect 
it can be a catalyst for change in your life. To provide an example of a non-health related keystone habit, experts in the field have found that the simple ritual of making your bed every morning can trigger additional behavior changes. Have you ever heard the old saying, the state of your bed is the state of your head? Based on our understanding of keystone habits, small wins and willpower, there is actually some truth to this idea. When you make your bed first thing in the morning, you're able to cross off the task and experience the satisfaction of a momentum generating small win, all before you've had your coffee. Furthermore, research has actually linked the act of making your bed to other positive behaviors like improved productivity, happiness, and, according to Dehig, even budgeting skills. As an added bonus, You've probably noticed that when you make your bed, the whole space seems tidier and more organized, even when the rest of the room is in disarray. Mr. Carrier further quotes one example from Mr. Dahig's book to illustrate the power of simply disrupting one vicious circle and including one healthy habit. In The Power of Habit, Dahig includes a particularly interesting anecdote about how a simple keystone habit was able to make significant changes in a corporate workplace. The CEO of Alcoa, or the Aluminum Company of America, was speaking to a large group of investors and stock analysts. To the crowd's dismay, rather than discussing profit margins and other business buzzwords, he wanted to discuss work safety. Worker safety remained his primary focus, and it paid off. Dahig recounts a conversation he had with O'Neill. I knew I had to transform Alcoa, O'Neill told me, but you can't order people to change. That's not how the brain works, so I decided I was going to start by focusing on one thing. If I could start disrupting the habits around one thing, it would spread throughout the entire company. In just one short year, the organization's profits reached a record high and annual net income increased by 500%. Just the single keystone habit of focusing on worker safety caused a ripple effect throughout the company, also encouraging workers to recommend business improvements and much improving communication. How long does it take for one habit to become an actual part of one's life and become solidified? Unlike the widespread belief that as many as 21 days are enough for a new habit to be formed, it takes more than 21 days, though, for an old image to depart and make way to a new solidified one. For many people, it could take much longer than 21 days for a new habit to become solidified. The most recent research on habit formation seems to support this concept as well. Mr. Carrier quotes a research study carried out by Dr. Philippa Lally, a psychologist at the University College London, to find out how long it takes one to form a new habit. Based on information reported daily by participants, the study ultimately found that, on average, it took 66 days for the participants' chosen behaviours to become automatic. As a result, and based also on the results of such studies, the author challenges us on a 66-day challenge to start implementing whatever new habit we may want to form and include in our daily routines. Because, instead of saying to ourselves that we want to make the bed every morning of the rest of our lives, the psychological burden is much lighter to say we want to do it for 66 days. And thus, we can start a new routine based on small wins, which may encourage us to do more. We are thus less prone to failure. We are not to take this 66-day time frame for granted, though, because it depends greatly on the person and the habit they want to form, as well as the circumstances under which such new habit is to be implemented. What next? Baby steps is what the author advises. Choose your keystone habit and break it down into small, achievable habits which you then build into your day-to-day -day life. Then create the mini-habit, trying at the same time not to lose sight of the bigger picture of what you are in fact trying to achieve. This is like a safety net. Changes are not easy, and at some point during the process, your mind might put in some resistance. Even the 66-day strategy may prove to be quite difficult to follow for some. 
By bearing in mind the ultimate goal, you make sure that your mind will not win by succeeding to talk you out of the strategy. Rather than dwelling on any inconvenience involved in performing your small habits, dwell on the overall outcome you are hoping to achieve. Say it out loud if you have to, because this big picture thinking can be a strong motivational tool to have in your toolbox. Another interesting point the author is making is that abstract thinkers will find it easier to succeed than concrete ones. Abstract thinkers were proven to exert higher self-control than the latter. He relies this observation on a study on factors influencing self-control. The author advises, in order for one to have better chances of succeeding forming new habits that stay with you in the long run, you should keep focused on what you are trying to achieve. Start small, but dream big. The next step on the agenda is to reward yourself. Based on the pleasure-pain dichotomy that underlies and governs all human actions, a Freudian find according to which humans are innately motivated to seek that which gives them pleasure and avoid that which causes them pain, it is the author's belief that this principle greatly applies to the habit creation process. So how does the pain-pleasure principle apply to the habit creation process? Let me explain by asking you a few questions. Why did you fail to achieve your New Year's Eve resolution to go to the gym four times a week? Because your brain associates it with pain, and as we just learned, the brain is wired to avoid pain under most circumstances. Why do you binge watch Orange is the New Black every evening until you go to bed instead of getting your work done? Watching TV brings you pleasure, while your brain associates work with pain. Not only would you have to turn off the TV, a painful task in and of itself, but you would have to buckle down and be productive. So, if you've been experiencing some resistance in your attempts to build a new habit, one very likely reason is that you are associating the action with some sort of physical or psychological pain. As a result, although your new habit could improve your life, you avoid it like the plague. The logical solution here is to flip that mental association from a painful one to a pleasant one by using a reward system. The reward you choose will help motivate you to execute your habit and increase the likelihood that you will continue to carry it out. Mr. Career goes on to give an outstanding example of how this principle can work to help someone achieve something. Dan Arely, a professor of psychology at Duke University, put the pain-pleasure principle into practice when he was unfortunately infected with hepatitis C. To cure himself, he was instructed to inject himself three days per week with enterferon, lasting for 18 months and resulting in some severe side effects such as fever, vomiting and dizziness, this particular treatment regimen isn't exactly easy to stick to. So what did Arely do? According to his best-selling book, Predictably Irrational, he used a reward system to help make his medication schedule more manageable. On the days he had to administer an injection, he would reward himself with watching one of his favourite movies. Because he was a movie lover, this strategy helped him to alter his mental associations with injection. Impressively, after he followed through with his treatment for the required 18 months, Arely's doctors told him that he was actually the only one of their patients who had been able to take the medication regularly. The other patients were understandably unable to overcome the pain associated with taking the medicine regularly as prescribed. Therefore, based on such a strategy, anyone can use the benefits of this kind of strategy by changing the mental associations of things we want to achieve with something which gives us pleasure in return. Visualization Another technique which can be employed to achieve change is visualization. It is a technique which implies the placing of visions in one's mind in order to accomplish something that they very much desire to accomplish. When used to help shape your life, these visions may include mental pictures of where you want to be in life, the kind of house that you want to live in and the kind of people you want to be with. To illustrate how this works, the author gives a very personal example. As a child, I saw myself as a concert pianist. I really wanted to become one. 
However, life would not allow me to have that throw. My parents said no, and as far as they were concerned, that was the end of the story. It could have been the end of the story, though my visualization of becoming a concert pianist didn't merely go away because of my parents' unfortunate financial circumstances. It stayed within my mind. On a day when other kids were happy playing in the fields, I would lie on the grass, close my eyes and imagine that piano and the wonderful sounds that it made. My vision stayed with me. It was cemented by my own visualizations. I saw the piano. I heard it. I felt the atmosphere that the music produced by it created. For me, that piano was very real. My visualization kept me going through my youth until one day I could actually afford those lessons. As I sat behind the keys of that piano, my destiny awaited me and I knew that my visualization would not only see me through my examinations, but would follow me for the rest of my life. The author further points that it is important to understand that visualization does not work with material things, that what one can achieve through visualization is a state of mind, a calm in the storm, or an awakened sense of awareness. It is essential that one have a very clear idea of what they want to achieve. You need to have a clear picture of what you need so that you can envisage it completely as part of the picture of your perfect life. The author further points to the fact that in order for the goal to be achieved, it needs to be very clear and tangible. In other words, may we add, remember to formulate smart goals, specific measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound. Another important thing in this equation is self-confidence. Without it, we risk allowing ourselves become the poor orator we think we are. The dance invitation will never become reality. Self-confidence comes from being able to visualize yourself in situations and being totally at ease with them. See yourself glide across the dance floor toward him. See yourself standing on a stage giving a presentation to a thousand people. See your mouth open and your words begin, but instead of muttering, visualize them as floating from your mouth toward the audience and being listened to intently. Feel the air pushing the words and giving them the strength and power that they need for the message to come across. If you believe in your abilities and can visualize them in advance, you find that when the real situation happens, it comes as a natural extension of who you are anyway, rather than pushing you to uncomfortable limits. When my hands hit the ivories of the piano, I was a concert pianist. It didn't matter if I had an audience of one or an audience of 2,000. The feeling within me was the same feeling. I put emotion into the touch of each ivory so that the music was almost magical. The thought of the piano becoming an extension to my hands was so ingrained into my thoughts that when it did happen, it was not a hardship for me to perform well. It was as if I had always been doing just that. For this reason, the meditative visualization gives you the edge and helps you to become more confident in all areas within your life. Perhaps you have problems talking to people and people intimidate you. They may not actually be aware that they are doing this, since the intimidation may actually be in your own mind. Once you drop the idea that you are being intimidated and start to appreciate that the words you are saying are having an impact, it will change your life forever. Sometimes, it is just a matter of self-esteem which stops someone from being the accomplished, self-confident person they wish to be. In such cases, identifying the cause of the situation and why that is so, and then working with yourself through visualization to eliminate such situations, may just be enough to turn the tables. I hate entering rooms because I feel like everyone is watching me. In this case, which is quite common with people who have self-esteem issues, the way to teach the mind to see things differently is to take out the element of the audience. It is obvious that it is the audience that worries the individual more than the entrance. Thus, take the audience out of the picture during visualization and simply imagine making an entrance flawlessly. It may be that the shoes chosen are ones that give you a wobble. It may be that the clothing worn is not comfortable. 
You need to see the whole picture and work on it bit by bit until you can make that perfect entrance and introduce the audience again, once you have fixed all of the potential areas of failure. By changing your own stance on life, you gain because you no longer have to feel out of control in any situation. Imagine it, see it in your mind's eye, play it through and then you are prepared for it when it happens. Of course, you will make mistakes, but that's all about being human rather than being about any self-esteem issue that you may have. You give yourself a much better time by actually envisaging situations and playing them out in advance, so you are never caught off guard. Each of us has, at some point in their lives, felt that a change would do them good. However, not everyone has the right tools or mindset to turn their lives into what they think would work better for them. No matter how convinced they may be of the benefit in the back of their minds, reluctance to change is many times much stronger than they could have ever imagined, and try as they might, they just do not seem to be able to surpass the difficulty of giving up bad habits and including new, healthier ones in their daily routines. This is what we have tried to do here. Show that there is no singularity in this kind of feat, and this does not have to be difficult. By setting out on the road well prepared with the right plan and strategies, you can not only manage to change your life into what you have always dreamed of to be, but also outstandingly succeed in exceeding all expectations. By applying psychology of change and or meditation visualization, you can become the contemporary dancer you have always wanted or the successful writer you intend to become. What you need to never forget is that it is all in your power to do so, that your mind can be not only your greatest help, the most useful of tools, but also the fiercest of your enemies once you've decided to give up pursuing your dreams.